Good morning. I'm going to just say a few uh, announcements before Nikki come up and does official announcements. If you want to hear the rest of that story, the rest of that music, the 19th will be your opportunity. 19th of Sunday night at 6 o'clock in our sanctuary, our children will be doing the musical. And part of the song, four soloists is awesome this morning. Could you believe that? I, I, boy, I hope I can stay 25 more years. I tell you, I really do. I'll only be 125, and that'll be okay. But I won't be able to these kids grow up and start singing in the big choir. Thank you. Great job, kids. Thank you. Next Sunday night, next Sunday night in the sanctuary, our adult choir will be doing our Christmas music. We're doing a little on the 12th, so a little early for us, but uh, that, that's a good thing. The choir has been working not hard, but long hours to get ready. So let me encourage you to encourage people to come. You be here. And uh, invite your neighbors, your friends. Next uh, Wednesday night will be Christmas caroling in the community. If you want to be a part of that, meet us here at the church at 6 o'clock in, in the back of the church, and we'll get ready to go. This past Wednesday, we went to the nursing home. What a blessing. What a blessing. So please do that. Uh, a lot of, lot of good things going on. Won't you be a part of it? God bless you. We'll have a great time of worship today. Nikki. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on, a little bit louder. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Yes, much better. It's good to see y'all this morning. I want you to say good morning to someone by winking at them. Go. <laughs> oh, isn't that fun? All righty. Open up your bulletins. Now, if you are a visitor, welcome again. But we would love for you to do something special. Turn to the back of your bulletin, and you can see this little flappy sheet of paper. We just want some more information on you. 
Fill that out and put it in the offering plate. It'll come down your aisle in a couple of minutes. Alrighty, if you open it up, you will see we have evening worship tonight. And it will start in here at 6 o'clock. We will first have a business meeting. Then we will break off and have a prayer walk, a mission prayer walk. And um, we want to have some light snacks tonight, mainly like cookies, something sweet, maybe some milk, mm, and a blanket. So, yeah, just bring some of that tonight um, so we can fellowship after our prayer walk. Um, also, something going on here is caroling, like Roy mentioned, Wednesday night. But what he didn't mention, it might get you here, too, is we're going to have hot chocolate at the Oliver's afterwards. So, two treats that night. All righty. Um, some things that aren't in the bulletin. I need to meet with the youth parents right after this, really quick, real fast. Um, and also, let's see, there is families going to be adopted or children adopted um, at the Pleasant Valley Elementary School. If you want are interested in that, adopting a, a child or two, a, maybe a Sunday school to do that, or in, an individual, um, just to help them out this Christmas, please see Miss Stewart. She has about 40 that need um, help. She has 40 on her list that still need to be assigned. So if you would like to do that, please see her. Very important. Um, and the one thing in your bulletin, if you see the poinsettia form, if you have not purchased one, please do so, and put in memory or in honor, and that will be in the bulletin in two weeks from now. So just get that to me or turn that into the office to Peggy. Um, and just know that all the funds will go to the Turner family for their Christmas. All righty, and before we begin the service, I think Mr. Handsome Wallace Elmrod has an announcement to make. There he is. <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, Ty asked Sir to help this Turner family, and uh, you did. Mm -hmm. A joint effort between uh, Pleasant Valley and Williams. We raised $6,583. And that was all the love. <laughs> and it, you know, I'm just proud I'm a part of this community and this family. That a lot of us didn't even know these people. And they are so grateful. I mean, it, you just had to have been there and seen it. But thank you again for doing that so much. Amen. All righty, thank you, Wallace. All righty, so now it's time to find that person that you winked at earlier, and you're going to give them a hug, okay? It's going to be some love, and let's warm this place up and hug each other. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In those days, John the Baptist began preaching in the Judean wilderness. His message was, Turn from your sin and turn to God, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare a pathway for the Lord's coming. Make a straight road for him. Hey, well, good morning again. Well, it's that time of the service where you have an opportunity to join in and sing and Joining our, our carolling and singing today. 
uh, if we prepare ourselves for worship, and that will have the Advent and then a lot of stuff that's going on. So 123, O come, O come, Emmanuel. One, two, three. Let's stand. Let's do the first, second life stand. walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. This is the second Sunday of Advent. Today we light the angel's candle that represents peace. Scripture tells us of the angels who sang about God's peace offered to all people through Jesus Christ. This is the peace that surpasses all understanding and guards our hearts and minds. Imagine hearing angels sing. What would it have been like to hear their song of good news? We can still know the peace of God in our hearts. This year, let us listen for the ways God might want to sing peace into our lives. And may we try to be peacemakers in our world today. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward all. Luke 2.14. Our mission moments this morning come verses come from Romans 15, 5, and 6, and it says, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may have one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Many people from Africa, Eastern Europe, and South America migrate to Spain in order to provide for their families or to flee from bad circumstances in their own community. CBF field personnel Joel and Tiffany Whitney serve among these individuals and share their faith in a personal God. These immigrants listen to scriptures passages on MP3 players donated by the First Baptist Church in Blue Springs, Missouri so that faith may come by hearing of the word of God. Pray that these immigrants often come 
from countries that are closed to the gospel might understand for the first time about the God who is loving, concerned about them personally, and has a plan for their salvation. Please pray that witness that the witness along with churches and other Christians will continue to meet the needs of these who are on a spiritual and perilous migratory journey. We do want to pray for our missionaries, all of those that have heard the call of Christ and answered as our missionaries that are with us today and these that are mentioned in the passage. We just thank God that people do hear the call and have the courage and the faith to step out. And let's have that same courage and faith to support them in our prayers and in our financial givings as we will hear these missionaries that are with us today they're self-supporting from our prayers and for the gifts that we have for them. And let's just remember them. And let's pause now for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning so thankful for this time that we can gather again in your house to worship our Lord in Jesus Christ. We do, we do thank you for his love for us all, that we might all understand the word and pass it on to those that do not understand. Father, give us faith and courage to go about each day doing and being what you'd have us to be. We again want to thank you for all the missionaries and all the people right in this community and in, in this town, in, the, in this state, and throughout the world that hear the word that you send to them and they have the faith to go out. Father, we all thank you for them. They go in our place. Let's be strong to support them where, as we are in our place here. Again, we want to thank you for the love of Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen. Nice job singing this morning. We really enjoyed that. In addition to that, you look pretty sharp as well. So, I have a question. Do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Does anyone know? Any ideas? Yes. A singer. Okay. What about you? Fashion designer. Yes. Hmm? An engineer. Yes. A spaceman. That was actually Blake's. That, oh, that was what he wanted to be when he grew up, actually. A lot of things. That was what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, Blake and I are, um, we're going to be missionaries in Chile. Um, but just because you all don't want to be missionaries for your career, that doesn't mean you can't be missionaries. Because right now, I'm a secretary, and Blake is a finance assistant. And we are still missionaries, even though we haven't moved somewhere strange and foreign. Um, in our daily jobs, we're able to, to be missionaries. We're able to show Christ's love to people, and we're able to, um, to do his work, as, um, to love people. And that's something that we can all do, even if we're students or if we're senior citizens or whatever we are, we can love people and show people Christ's love in us. And so I just want you to know that whatever it is that you decide to be when you grow up, and if that changes a bunch of times, like it did for me, <laughs> God can still uh, be present, and you can still be a missionary, even though you're not a missionary in title. Um, let's pray together, okay? Dear Lord, I thank you so much for each and every one of these boys and girls and these young men and young women, Lord. I, I thank you for their hearts, Lord, and I thank you that they are your children. Father, I pray that you would uh, be with them and guide them through every step in their life, Lord, that it would glorify you, Father, and that they would become who they are meant to be in you, Lord. I thank you again for each one of them and for what they mean to you and for what they mean to this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I told, this is a, of course, 
every day is a special day, but this is a special day for one of our church members, and I just really got to say something about it. If there's someone in the choir right now just sort of cringing, <laughs> it's probably Patsy Boozer, because the day is her birthday, so let's give it up for Patsy, okay? <laughs> One thirty-eight. Go tell it on the mountain. Be the offertory carol for the morning. We're going to stand. We're going to sing all three stanzas. One
Thank you, George. Let us stand for the doxology. my privilege today to introduce our speakers, uh, missionaries from the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, Blake and Becca Hart. We welcome you to Williams. We're glad you're here. We already had a wonderful time uh, listening to their stories and their expectations for their uh, journeys and their mission work in Chile. Uh, during the Sunday school hour, they'll show some more about that and about other things related to missions this morning. Uh, as you all know, at uh, Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus into the world, which is part of God's great mission to share with us the good news of how much God loves all of us. And it is at Christmas time, typically for us Baptists, especially in the South, to remember those around the world, in our own communities and around the world, who need to hear and want to hear that good news and that message. And so it's during this time of year that we focus a lot of attention on missions uh, tonight we'll have a prayer walk as we go through and have the opportunity to walk through different places in our church, hear stories about missionaries and missions and so forth, and then uh, pray for them and the peoples that they work with. Today we're very blessed to have two newly appointed Cooperative Baptist Fellowship missionaries who will be going uh, to serve in the desert uh, in northern Chile with the Amira people. And uh, we're very excited about that. I don't know, I was talking to them afterwards, they're from North Carolina. Uh, met at the Baptist Student Union at Mars Hill College and, uh, and all that. I'm thinking, you know, of all the places to go in South America, he showed us a satellite picture of this little tiny place uh, in the desert in the northern part of Chile uh, I had never heard of. They have it spelled out in rocks so you can see it from space. Uh, it's just a tiny little place. Uh, it reminded me of the Christmas story of Jesus and our children singing so well for us this morning. Uh, what are you, the King, the Savior, doing in a place like this? Uh, I'm proud that we have people who feel called and are answering that call to serve in places like Bethlehem and in the deserts of northern Chile. Uh, and we're looking forward to getting to know you better. We welcome you here and offer our blessings to you in your ministries. By the way, Blake will be graduating from the McAfee School of Theology, a school we support and have supported for many years as a founding church. Uh, also, he'll be graduating with Brandon Tubbs, uh, who's from our church, and y'all know. So he'll be graduating in May. We wish your blessings and good fortune for you as you continue your studies and finish that up. So they'll come after the choir sings. We look forward to the message God has laid on your hearts to share with us today.
Thank you, choir, for that beautiful song. And it's by providence that you sang a song today called Follow Me. And you'll find out some more about that later. Uh, thank you all very much for, for having us here and for your continued and faithful support of the offering for Global Missions and for the ministries of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Um, through those gifts and offerings, <coughs> uh, we have been able to stand in solidarity with the poor, the oppressed, uh, to offer the good news of Christ's kingdom to those who have never heard it before, and to offer the peace of Christ in some of the world's most tumultuous situations. And so, so we're very thankful uh, for your ongoing and faithful support. Um, today we want to sp speak a little bit about call, and that seems to be the age-old struggle of the Christian. What's God calling me to? What's God's will for my life? I remember worrying year after year through high school and into college about what God wanted me to do. What did God want me to become? And so I'm pretty sure that there's someone here who is struggling with that question. Perhaps a youth who's nearing graduation looking to what's ahead. Perhaps you've lost your job and you don't know where to go next. Or maybe you're just discontented with where you are, and you're just wondering if God has called you to something more, if you're missing out on what God has in store for you. But I've come to wonder if maybe we're missing the point. Maybe we're making it more difficult than it really is. Is God's call really to this place or to that job? Or is God's call at its core simply to follow Christ? As I look back on my life, I can really see how this was the case in my, in my experience. I do remember when I first uh, felt and expressed a call to ministry. I was in the youth at my church in Swannanoa, North Carolina. And a missionary from West Virginia came and, and shared stories. He worked in the impoverished coal mining areas. And he shared stories and pictures and spoke of their need. And it wasn't just stories of material need, but the need to feel loved, to know that someone actually did care for them, that they weren't forgotten. And it was because of that experience, because of those stories, that I walked the aisle of my church and let the pastor know that I felt called into the ministry. Of course, I didn't want him to tell the con congregation that, just in case I heard wrong or in case I wanted out of it later on. Um, but from that time, I didn't think about it much more. I tried to follow Jesus as best I could, but by the time I finished high school, that call was not in the forefront of my mind. I headed to college to study music education. And so once I arrived at college, I got to know other Christians on campus. Um, in high school, even though that call to ministry kind of faded into the background, my identity was still mainly formed around my faith, around Jesus Christ. And so it was only natural when I got to college to seek out the Baptist Student uh, Union, the Baptist Campus Ministry. And through that, I learned of an opportunity to serve summer missions uh, through the State Baptist Convention. And so I signed up, and I became a youth minister at a small rural church in North Carolina. And that was one of the best summers in my life. I felt like I was alive, working with the youth, taking them on trips, teaching Bible lessons. It was amazing. And that call was rekindled at that time. But I'm also very stubborn. So even though I added a religion major to my plate in college, I still refused to let go of music. And it wasn't until my senior year that I finally completely dropped this, the music major and had a very large music minor. Um, and the reason that I decided to do that was because I realized that music became a chore. I still loved music, but, but the classes, the ensembles, it was a chore, and my joy was not in that anymore. And at that point, I was working in a local church. I was a part-time youth minister at a church in Weaverville, North Carolina. And while I was doing that, I just knew that that was what God was calling me to, to do something in ministry. At the same time, through the Baptist Student Union, uh, we were able to go on various short-term mission trips. We went to Baltimore, went to Gulfport, and finally we went to Honduras. And through all those mission trips, and through my work with that group, that youth group, I was continually confronted with images of need, and the more I saw, the more I knew that that was what God wanted me to do, that I could not see that and turn my back on it anymore. So after graduation, in an effort to stop speaking about faith in my classes and to start living it, I took off to Ecuador to take part in a 10-month uh, mission endeavor um, 
to work alongside an Ecuadorian pastor to help him with pastoral training and, and lay leadership development. Uh, we were trying to implement a house church model in the area, and so for that to survive, it's imperative that you have a lot of leaders who are called up from the people. And through this, I fell in love with the culture of the Andes Mountains. I also realized that I needed more training, though. So I came back, and after Becca and I got married, I uh, started classes at the McAfee School of Theology. And through various experiences there, we have discerned that Chile is where God is calling us. But notice that I didn't have a Damascus Road experience. It wasn't like at the very beginning God came down when I was in that church as a youth and said, you're going to go to Chile someday, just so you know. I wanted to throw that out there. That wasn't what happened. Instead, it was just my daily walking with Christ. Through ups and downs, through the times I was listening and through the times that I was being stubborn about it, that led me to this point where I'm not only willing to go, but I'm eager to go. I'm eager to get on an airplane, go to a place I've never been before, and to take part in ministries that now I can't even imagine. All the time, it was a process. Much like Blake, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't experience a dramatic calling. Unlike Blake, I never even felt the tug to walk an aisle and make a commitment to serve God full time. In fact, having some kind of divine calling never really crossed my mind. Much like many of you in my, church, or in my younger years in, uh, through church, I spent time in nursing homes, visiting the elderly, collecting food for the hungry, and taking annual mission trips. I enjoyed those things, but the thought of doing something like that for a living didn't cross my mind. In addition to not feeling a call to the ministry, I also didn't feel a call to anything in particular at least not for very long. This was reflected in my annual this is what I want to be when I grow up conversations with my high school guidance counselor as well as the number of times I changed my major in college. By my senior year in college I had two majors I couldn't pick just one history and Spanish and still no idea what I wanted to do. I spent a lot of sleepless nights fretting over what I was gonna do when May came I prayed a lot, but never really thought that the God I was praying to might have a ministry-related answer to my questions. So, to avoid having to figure out what I really wanted to do, and more importantly, what God really wanted me to do, I did what a lot of people in that position do. I decided to go to grad school. Perhaps delaying the question would buy enough time to reveal the real answer. Of course, deciding to go to grad school meant I actually had to choose a school, and I would also have to choose a course of study. Since I'd already proven my incompetence at making decisions on my own, I, and I didn't feel any real direction, I consulted my academic advisor. She helped me decide on Hispanic studies and told me that she thought I could get into any number of competitive programs if I could spend some time working in Latin America. I told my parents. They were less than thrilled, but remained supportive. And when a family friend told my dad that his family was packing up and moving to Ecuador to be missionaries, my dad connected us. We met a few weeks later at a pizza parlor, and they showed me pictures of the slums they'd be working in. By the time the meal was over, it was the slums that we'd be working in. Still, I had no inkling of a calling. That spring, Blake and I went to Honduras with the Baptist Student Union. I was so excited. I'd never been on an international mission trip. We were going to a Spanish-speaking country, and I was looking forward to putting all of those long hours of studying into practice. The first day, I tried to ask a group of children at the orphanage if one of the other little boys was deaf. Instead, I asked if he was a pig. In my defense, the words are quite similar. <laughs> After overcoming that blunder and spending a whole week loving on children, I felt something. I was too overcome with joy to realize that what I was feeling was a calling. But I did feel that my upcoming time in Ecuador probably wasn't meant to just be a line on an application for grad school. I was right. My time working with children in one of the poorest areas of the country made me feel alive. I knew that there was no way I could experience what I had only to go back home and lead a normal life. 
Frederick Buechner once said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. God didn't call me then to go somewhere I didn't want to go or to do something I didn't want to do. The same is true now as well. I'm willing to go. I want to go. My deep gladness comes from working with children that have been neglected by their families and by their society. How awesome then that this is what God has called me to. Looking back, I see that God was calling. I also see that I was following, but I didn't really know to where. That's the beauty of the Spirit's call. You don't have to start out with all the answers. It's a matter of following God where you feel God is leading you next, not where you feel God is leading you ultimately. All of those mission activities and trips when I was in school, feeling a nudge to major in Spanish, and having a strong desire to stand up for injustice against children weren't accidents. Those trips were preparation. That nudge was the Holy Spirit. And that desire came from God. So now you've heard our stories. And so to close, I want to offer some, some scripture, since that's what we do. Um, from the Bible, that sort of reinforces this, so you know that we're not just speaking on our own will. Um, and so I want to talk about, in Matthew's Gospel, uh, we find something very interesting about calling. And it's that whenever Jesus calls his disciples, he says one short sentence, follow me. On the sh seashore with Peter and Andrew and James and John, it's just follow me. When he comes to the tax collector table with Matthew, it's, it's follow me. And that's all it is. It's to each and every one of us also. It's, the call is simply to follow Jesus I mean, could you imagine if Jesus had approached Peter, calling him to what he would one day become? Can you see the scene on the shoreline? Peter, I want you to stand up to the Sanhedrin. I want you to tell them that they are wrong and that they should believe in me. They'll flog you, of course, but you should keep on preaching because after, after all, you will found my church. And so just in case you know, the church is a group of believers who follow me. Uh, you do know that, don't you? Because you see what Peter's response would have been to that? Um, you mean me? I'm just a fisherman. How on earth do you expect me to do that? But see, that's the beauty of it. God did all those things through Peter. Peter is known for his courage. He's known for his ability to preach, and he is known for founding the church. But he got to that point through following Jesus day by day, learning about the kingdom of God, learning what the kingdom of God was all about, and learning how to believe in that kingdom. In essence, that's what, we, that's what the call of Christ means for all of us. It means that we, first of all, have faith in Jesus. We believe in him. And that we then act upon that faith. We learn about him, and then we become witnesses of who Christ is to the world. And that looks different for all of us. The trajectory doesn't always lead to going off to some other country to serve Christ. It doesn't always mean going to seminary and becoming a minister. It does, however, mean being so transformed by Christ's working within us that our lives become the transforming presence to those around us. Take, for example, the two tax collectors that encountered Jesus. First one is Matthew. Jesus himself comes to his tax booth and says, follow me. And Matthew does it. He gives up everything and follows Christ. He learns about Jesus, learns to act like Jesus, and eventually becomes one of the 12 apostles of the early church. The other example, however, is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming to town. He climbs a tree to get a good view. And when Jesus sees him, he calls him out and says that he will be sharing a meal with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is so transformed by this encounter with Christ that he pays fourfold back those he had cheated, and he gives half of his possessions to the poor. And then what does he do? He continues being a tax collector. He doesn't get up and follow Jesus to some foreign place, some distant calling, because that wasn't God's call for him. That was God's call for Matthew. Zacchaeus' calling was to be a just tax collector, and that's what he did. He was so transformed by Christ and, trans and, and transformed the way he acted in his business. I assume that led to many ministry opportunities, Imagine when he gave back the money to people he had cheated. 
what doors that opened. Or when newcomers to the area were surprised that this tax collector only asked for the money that the Romans required of him to ask. So you see, God's call is different for every person, except for the fact that the call always begins with, follow me, follow Jesus, learn what it means to walk in his footsteps, learn what the kingdom that he came to proclaim looks like, and then act it out in your life. For some of us, that will lead us to hard places, because that's where the world's need and our passions intersect. For others, you will be called to stay exactly where you are, living a transformed life so that those near you can see Christ. Thomas Akempis says, let this be your whole endeavor, this your prayer, this your desire, that you may be stripped of all selfishness and with entire simplicity follow Jesus only. That's our calling, to follow Jesus, to be disciples, to make disciples, and to live in God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. This time we're going to have a, a moment of invitation. Uh, again, I would like for you, if you would, just to, uh, in the silence of our sanctuary in this beautiful place, uh, let's just bow our heads for a moment. Uh, I think we've been challenged in many ways by seeing living examples of people who have uh, answered the call uh, to go to a place that uh, really is quite unknown to them, to do things that they uh, are not quite sure uh, will work out the way they plan. Uh, I'm sure God will have a, a lot of vistas open to them. I'd like for you just to think about this morning as uh, our time of invitation, uh, the things that God may be calling you to do. Uh, what is God asking you to be now? Uh, they've spoken to us about a couple of things, about maybe leaving your comfort zone and going and doing something different than what you've been doing in the name of Jesus. They've also asked you to consider being where you are, maybe being a stronger witness for Jesus, a more transformed Christian so that your influence, God through you, can impact somebody's life. I'd like for you to consider that this morning as our invitation to consider your calling. Uh, some of you may have other decisions. You need to come forward to pray, to accept Christ as your Savior, to join our church. I always make that available, and I'll be here for you if you need that. Let's spend a moment in prayer, please. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. Amen. At this time, I know it's a little bit different, but I, I just feel led to do this. Uh, Blake and Becca uh, are going to be going to Chile in January, and then later on being appointed, I guess they'll go officially. I know you're graduating in May, so sometime after May uh, to actually move there and live uh, in the little place where they're going to be going. Uh, I would like for them to know that uh, this church at Williams will be praying for them in that process. Uh, and I'd like for us to have a little blessing for them now. Uh, we want to offer our blessings to you, and I want to pray for you, if that, that's okay, uh, before we, uh, we dismiss. And then I'm going to ask them to stand down front and allow you, if you would like, to come by and offer your own blessing and words of encouragement and support. Uh, and this is something that God laid on my heart. I really just thought about it uh, recently, and then after meeting them for the first time today. Uh, we have missionaries come here every December. Uh, as part of our really strong emphasis on global missions. Uh, we have missionaries periodically, but every December we have that. Uh, I wonder if you would accept this challenge. Uh, let's walk with them in prayer uh, through a year. We'll have someone else come next December, but for this year, uh, could we commit to pray for this couple as they begin their ministry? And they are raising their own funds uh, because of the economy. Uh, CBF and a lot of missions agencies doesn't have the money to support the people who are going out and feeling called, as we obviously saw today. Uh, so I want to encourage us to help support them in some way through this year financially. 
uh, as well as with our prayers. Would y'all be willing to accept that one-year challenge to, to do that? So we're going to ask you to help us know about your needs. Uh, they've, they've got some uh, list in the back if you'd like to sign up for uh, get prayer email requests and other things, and hopefully you'll do that with me as well. Uh, and you'll let us know some of your needs. Uh, their, their church back home bought them a Jeep. Uh, because they're going to be going on these mountainous dirt roads. Uh, there might be many other little things as you get there. We'd like to help in some way, uh, if, that, if that's okay, and uh, we'd like to pray for you. Okay? Y'all willing to do that? Okay. I'm going to ask them to stand here, uh, and I'm just going to say a word of blessing for them on our behalf as a church, and then they're going to be down front uh, after our benediction. And you'd like to come by, you're welcome to say what you want with them. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you so much for this wonderful couple that you have sent to our place at Williams. Uh, we're blessed by hearing their stories of calling, uh, their willingness to listen to you and follow you into places that they probably did not expect when they were uh, going on these mission trips and listening to the Bible and going to worship and praying back at uh, college at Mars Hill. But God, we're glad that's where you want them to be. We believe that. We've heard their stories, and we want to bless them. This church at Williams offers their blessings to Blake and Becca Hart. I pray, God, that you would give your blessings of protection and safety for them as they travel and serve and find their place. Give them clarity of vision and the courage to follow through with the things that you would have them to do. Uh, make people receptive and open to help walk with them as they serve together with the Amara people in uh, northern Chile. Uh, we pray, God, that their families would feel comfortable and good about their decision and feel at peace in their hearts. God, we look forward to hearing good things about this couple. We thank you that you still call people to ministry and people are still listening to walk out on faith. And God, our word today is simply this. We offer our blessing on their decision to be missions personnel and to the work that they will be doing. We pray for your blessings and your guidance and your supernatural help on them. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right. Let's, stand, let's sing our little chorus. Go tell them on the mountain. You know it. Stand with us, please. Let's sing an okay. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere go, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. God bless you. See you back tonight. Come on down and greet our friends.